Now it's a real honor to present to you four uh, <laughs> not only outspoken, but forward-thinking, proactive, courageous bishops who have really made a difference, not only in their own archdioceses and dioceses, but also throughout the country. You hear them on uh, the radio and television. You certainly read about them in the newspapers. They've made some great, tough stands. And um, I'm, George Weigel is going to be moderating this panel. I'll just uh, give you uh, the names of the bishops on it. Of course, Archbishop Chaput, our own uh, Napa Institute um, uh, chair of our board of ecclesiastical advisors. He's just wonderful and been with the board since the uh, very beginning. And uh, Bishop Paprocki from Springfield, Illinois. Uh, um, uh, Bishop Strickland from Tyler, Texas. Bishop Daly from my previous diocese, Spokane, Washington. Uh, I just uh, welcome them all to the stage along with George Weigel, who will be moderating uh, this panel, which is on shepherding uh, the flock in times of crisis. Shepherding the flock in times of crisis for really terrific, proactive bishops. Welcome to uh, all of you. God bless you. God bless you. Good morning, uh, <clears throat> good morning everyone. Uh, good to be back with you again. On, uh, on uh, June 22nd, uh, I was happy to uh, welcome uh, into our family my wife's and my fifth grandchild, uh, a little boy who has, if you can imagine it, the name John Paul Weichel. So John was born on the feast of Saints John Fisher and Thomas More, uh, to whom both of whom I have a, a great devotion. And between that and thinking about this panel today, I was reminded of, of a prayer that St. John Fisher wrote. We know him as, as a martyr under Henry VIII. He was also a great biblical scholar serious educator, uh, and a man of, of deep, deep piety. So I thought it might be appropriate to begin uh, our session today with John Fisher's prayer for bishops. Lord, according to your promise that the gospel should be preached throughout the whole world, raise up men fit for such work. The apostles were but soft and yielding clay till they were baked hard by the fire of the Holy Ghost. So good, Lord, do now in like manner again with thy church militant, change and make the soft and slippery earth into hard stone. Set in thy church strong and mighty pillars that may suffer and endure great labors, watching poverty, thirst, hunger, cold, and heat, which also shall not fear the threatening of princes, persecution, neither death, but always persuade and think with themselves to suffer with a good will, slanders, shame, and all kinds of torments for the glory and laud of thy holy name. By this manner, good Lord, the truth of thy gospel shall be preached throughout all the world. Therefore, merciful Lord, exercise thy mercy Show it indeed upon thy church. Amen. Amen. First thing I would like to say, in addition to thanking the bishops for being with us today, uh, is to ask all of you to pray for them uh, and for their uh, brother bishops. Uh, these men are doing extremely difficult jobs under extremely difficult circumstances, and they deserve our support, our affection, and our solidarity in prayer. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover in about 50 minutes, so I have uh, asked Bishop Paprocki, who is the uh, distinguished canon lawyer in the group, 
to summarize for all of us the motu proprio issued by Pope Francis on the handling of clerical sexual abuse cases uh, and the procedures adopted by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops at its June meeting uh, in, to implement that document and to carry forward the reform work that the bishops began in 2002. Uh, bishop Paprocki will speak to that for a few minutes and then I will ask each of the other bishops uh, to say a word about how uh, these processes are being implemented in their own local churches. Bishop Paprocki. Thank you, George. Good morning, everyone. As George said, we have a lot of ground to cover here in a short time, so I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can, not go diving into a lot of details, but just sort of a bird's eye view here. I'll, uh, I'll take a page from, that I learned from my mentor, the late Francis Cardinal George, who, uh, if you ever saw him preach or give a talk, he'd have a little scrap of paper with a few notes on it from which he would get up and give a very robust uh, talk in, in full paragraphs. Well, I don't have time for full paragraphs, but I'll try to be as robust as I can with this in a short time. Speaking of Cardinal George, by the way, the, the movie tonight, Glorious Lives, uh, is about Cardinal George. That may not be clear in the in materials in your brochure, uh, but it's a documentary about uh, Francis Cardinal George. So if you want to uh, see a tribute to him, that'll be tonight at 9 o'clock, Glorious Lives. First of all, let me put this in context. You know, go back a little over a year ago, of course, what started this whole tsunami, in a sense, uh, was, of course, the McCarrick allegations and then the uh, Pennsylvania grand jury report that was issued uh, in August. And so coming up on the USCCB meeting in November, that was very much on the minds of many people, as well as the bishops. And we had a number of proposals that we were going to vote on. Uh, I'm a member of the Committee on Canonical Affairs and Church Governance, and we had, we had several proposals, the key one of which was a special commission, a national commission that would be uh, similar to the uh, review boards that we have in our dioceses. That was all, as you know, put on hold uh, at the request of the Holy See, uh, pending the outcome of the uh, special uh, meeting that took place in the Vatican in February. Uh, that meeting was uh, convened with the presidents of all the Episcopal conferences uh, from around the world that took place in February at the Vatican. And out of that uh, came a document uh, issued by uh, Pope Francis in May called Vos Estis Lux Mundi, Latin for You Are the Light of the World. Traditionally, um, church documents have these Latin titles from the first words of the document. I want to mention another document, though, that uh, may have been overlooked, uh, and, but it's very important and should be seen in tandem with the motu proprio. It was a document issued by Pope Francis on June 4, 2016, that a lot of people uh, missed, and I don't think got much media coverage. Unusual also in the sense that it does not have a Latin title, it has an Italian title. It was issued in Italian and then uh, later translated into other languages. The title is Come una madre amorevole, as a loving mother, taken from the first line of that document that the church uh, loves her children as a loving mother, but especially for those who are most uh, uh, defenseless and vulnerable. And it's very interesting that both of these documents, Come Una Madre Amarevole and Vos Estis Lux Mundi, uh, use the term vulnerable adults. So in the context of uh, Cardinal McCarrick's um, uh, misconduct with seminarians, that, that uh, issue of, of vulnerable adults is something that is very much on everyone's uh, radar as well. Vos Estis Lux Mundi is a motu proprio, which means that it comes by the Pope's own uh, initiative and uh, one of the key features in, in that uh, document, of course, is what is being referred to as the metropolitan model. So what we had proposed in, um, in November at the USCCB with a special commission, for one thing, uh, there were many of us, uh, myself included, who felt that uh, we needed to do something. Uh, there was a sense of there was a lacuna here. There, there's, there's, we have to fill this void. <clears throat> and so we were coming up with proposals, and that's why it was uh, it was uh, disconcerting when we were told, put all that on hold. But uh, what came out of that then is, is the, the Vatican then did, did give this direction to go into with basically the metropolitan model, which I had expressed some reservation about myself when it was first proposed in November because, as I pointed out from the floor of the USCCB, I said Cardinal McCarrick himself was a metropolitan. 
and uh, to have a system where the senior uh, suffragan, who would in a sense be within the same province uh, investigating this, I didn't know how objective that would be. Well, Vos Estes does address that and I think provides some safeguards for that so that the, an allegation does not go simply uh, to the Metropolitan uh, or in the case of the Metropolitan to the, the senior suffragan, uh, that's the, the bishop senior uh, in, within the province, uh, but it would also go to the apostolic nuncio and so that there would be, uh, and, and from there to the Holy See. In, in conjunction with Vos Estes is, uh, is the document that was issued by the USCCB. A number of documents actually need to be seen in tandem uh, that we approved at our plenary uh, meeting this past June in Baltimore. And those were the directives for the implementation of Vos Estes. And uh, in, in the implementation, we make that even more explicit that not only is the uh, Metropolitan uh, and the nuncio to be, uh, uh, to be uh, informed of an allegation, but the metropolitan or the senior suffragan is to designate a layperson who would also be the recipient of that report. In addition, uh, we also adopted a national third party reporting system so that, uh, in fact, the first line uh, of information, anybody who wants to bring an allegation would be to an, to an uh, independent objective national third party reporting system who would then notify the Metropolitan uh, and the Apostolic uh, Nuncio. Another safeguard in uh, Vos Estes that would prevent uh, a, a Metropolitan from, uh, or a senior suffragan from simply burying this is the fact that uh, it also provides that the Holy See itself can, can determine that if they feel the, that a Metropolitan uh, lacks the objectivity or impartiality in a certain case or if he has a conflict of interest, they could assign it to uh, another metropolitan or indeed to uh, another bishop. Uh, this also needs to be seen in conjunction with the two other documents affirming our Episcopal commitments. Uh, and this is a pledge uh, to use lay people in these, in these processes. Uh, so in uh, Vos Estes authorizes the use of lay people uh, when an allegation is brought forward against a bishop and our uh, statement of affirmation of Episcopal commitments says that we pledge uh, to use lay, lay people. And then there was another document called Protocol regarding available non-penal restrictions on bishops uh, who have resigned. And that would be the case of a, a bishop uh, who had retired, but then some years later, uh, some uh, uh, information comes out about uh, him that uh, uh, shows that he did not handle cases properly, that a bishop could, uh, the current bishop could put some uh, non-penal restrictions on him, uh, such as uh, limiting his public uh, ministry. Uh, also uh, involved with this uh, idea of the um, um, uh, Episcopal commitment is, is that, uh, you know, we, there was a statement of Episcopal commitment that came out of uh, um, the norms and the essential, the essential norms and the charter that were adopted in 2002, uh, and that we are aff affirm in a sense that those documents also apply to bishops. And I think that's one thing I, I do want to correct that, that people have this impression that uh, what the bishops adopted in um, Dallas in 2002 did not apply to bishops. And it did not apply strictly in the same sense as for priests. However, it did apply uh, and with, with the necessary changes. The necessary change obviously being that a bishop is accountable to the pope and not to another bishop. But we do see in practice how, how some of these uh, situations have been implemented. For example, even in the McCarrick case that did start uh, last June with the finding of a review board, uh, that the allegation against Cardinal McCarrick was uh, involving sexual abuse of a minor when he was a priest of the Archdiocese of New York that was submitted to a review board. It was reviewed by the review board uh, with the approval of the Holy See, which led to his resignation from the College of Cardinals uh, as you know that from there, it was also a trial which eventually culminated in his um, uh, being dismissed from the clerical state. More recently, we also see uh, similar kinds of, uh, of approach being taken with, uh, with, Archbishop, with uh, Bishop Mike, uh, Michael Bransfield regarding financial misconduct and that too using, um, in a sense, the metropolitan model with uh, lay advisors and that, that um, resulted in, in his being 
uh, removed from public ministry. So I think looking at this now, uh, a year later, in retrospect, we can see that some of the procedures that have been put in place uh, have worked and they are effective. It didn't, it was maybe not clear to us at the time, but I, I think that we should see that uh, some very significant steps have been taken, and I think we also have seen some very significant results from this. Thank you, Bishop Paprocki. I'd now like to ask, uh, in order, Archbishop Shapio, Bishop Daly, and Bishop Strickland uh, to speak to their own experience uh, of the implementation of Vos Estes Lux Mundi and this Metropolitan Plan, and to speak as well uh, to their experience of how uh, the lay review boards in their dioceses uh, have functioned to help them uh, in their roles as, as shepherds of the flocks entrusted to them, addressing uh, both problems of sexual abuse <clears throat> and misgovernance. Archbishop Shapu. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Bishop Papaki. You did a great job summarizing things. Uh, I was ordained a bishop 31 years ago today in Rapid City, South Dakota. So I have been a bishop a long time. Um, 31 years is a long time I've been a bishop a long time in three different, very different kinds of dioceses. When I was a bishop of Rapid City, the sexual abuse issue began to be a major issue. I even had a trial. The diocese was uh, sued and on trial uh, during my time there for an incident that happened long before I became the bishop of Rapid City. Um, it was a terrible experience. And But one of the things that I discovered in the course of that was uh, everybody in our culture, I'm 74 years old, so those of you who are older will know this to be true, thought that protecting the reputation of the church, but in other contexts, reputation of a school district or uh, you know, uh, another organization was the most important thing that its leaders should do. And so when things came up that would be scandalous, there was an effort to be quiet about it. Uh, in the course of that uh, trial in Rapid City, about something that happened 30 years before I was a bishop there, it became clear that the sheriff, who was uh, responsible for the area at the time, took the priest who was abusing to the bishop and said, you take care of him. So back in those days, even the civil society covered it up by uh, you know, handling it in an indirect rather than a direct kind of way. Uh, I became the Bishop of Denver uh, some years, after nine years in Rapid City, went to Denver for 14, and we developed a lay review board to help the bishop make decisions about whether or not someone should uh, re be removed from ministry. Um, and I made a commitment that I would never uh, act contrary to the advice of the review board. Uh, because the problem, of course, had been that bishops who see the priests in a very special way as their sons can be somewhat prejudiced in that direction when it comes to making decisions. So the corrective for me was to be, um, in a sense, obedient to the direction of the lay review board. And I've always been faithful to that in my ministry as bishop in Denver and also in Philadelphia. Eight years ago, I was moved from Denver to Philadelphia because uh, 10 years ago, Philadelphia had its own grand jury report apart from the one that the state of Pennsylvania had last year. And that was an extraordinarily difficult period in the life of the Church of Philadelphia. Um, when I was appointed the bishop, 26 of the Philadelphia priests had been removed from ministry and were waiting a decision whether or not they would go back to ministry um, in the light of that Pennsylvania grand jury report. So I went in there and discovered that the Cardinal Regali, who was a bishop before me, had actually established some very good norms to protect the young people of the diocese. And one of those most important norms was that there, we would hire an investigator of any accusation of sexual abuse who would be objective apart from the clergy of the uh, Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And we, we hired an extraordinarily good man for this who was a prosecutor for the district attorney's office in Philadelphia. And uh, all the cases were reviewed by a, a, an extraordinary group of people. We developed a review board with um, rather astonishing um, credentials 
Um, a third of them aren't even Catholic, but all of them volunteer their time um, for the protection of children and for the good of the church. And so what, what we do in Philadelphia is if, if an accusation comes before me of anything, whether it's a sexual thing with children or with the vulnerable adults or even non-vulnerable adults or financial, it immediately goes to the investigator uh, who is rather ruthless in pursuing the information behind the accusation. And then that material is submitted to the review board. Now, the review board serves different functions for me. It's laid, it's, there's a, one priest on it, the rest are all lay people. And uh, the material that they review is material submitted by the investigator. And uh, they, uh, some of it's about sexual abuse of minors. There's a, a small group within that group that reviews sexual abuse of others who are not minors and other sexual misconduct. And then when it comes to finances, I have a uh, Arsas and Finance Council that would receive any report and give advice to me on how to proceed. So I think we have an extraordinary um, program to protect children and also to protect the church. Now, having said that, it's possible that my review board could be corrupt too, I guess, you know, because laity aren't any better than the clergy. I don't know if you recognize that. <laughs> um, I just, I always like to remind people, I um, mentioned this earlier this week um, to the board of, of uh, our institute that in Philadelphia, when I got there, we had a huge financial problem, huge, a debt of about three and a half, $350 million. And how we got that to that position was that the lay finance council, which isn't an advisory council, but has real authority, didn't do their job. I mean, they, they let all this happen without the appropriate kind of guidance that uh, you would expect a group of professionals, and they were very professionals uh, to give. And the reason they didn't is, of course, they had a, a, a too much of a respect for bishops, and they wanted to please the bishops, so they didn't ask for things that they should have asked for, and if they didn't get adequate information, they, have a, they had a duty to require it, and they didn't, re, didn't, uh, didn't require it, didn't demand it. So if we're gonna reform the church, my dear friends, you have to do your job too. You know, you have to, you have to be willing, you have to be willing to t t take us on when we're in inappropriate or when we are not professional. Um, and if you do that and we do our part, things will be corrected. Um, I'm quite tired of all this kind of stuff, quite honestly, I'm sure all of you are too. Um, I think we've been doing a very good job in the United States for the most part. There are exceptions, of course. In that situation in Wheeling, West Virginia, shows that, that their finance council apparently wasn't, wasn't appropriately acting either. Um, but if we just do our part, things will be straightened out. There'll always be sin, there'll always be mistakes, but I think that uh, we have the tools in place. Hopefully you have the courage in your hearts uh, to do something about the problems. So that's all I have to say. I became the bishop of the Diocese of Spokane four years ago, and coming to the diocese, uh, some of you may know, we were in bankruptcy. So when you enter a diocese that has filed bankruptcy or in bankruptcy for a period of eight years, there is um, a blessing to that cross in the fact that uh, usually between lawyers and business people, the diocese has been held to a, a higher standard. And um, a review board was already in place uh, with Bishop Skillstead, who was the bishop uh, two before me. And the review board, again, is, as the Archbishop has said, and um, as Bishop Raprocki spoke about, composed of primary lay people with a background. It's always very good, I have found, to have someone with law enforcement uh, present because of the need to do a thorough investigation. And this review board has been um, very effective. Um, there was a challenge at times that a review board maybe likes the, uh, they're, they're there, they're giving of their time, and there's a busyness, especially when you're sorting through all sorts of cases. But as things uh, thankfully calmed down, uh, there was a, a kind of a desire, well, is there still more to do? And um, thank God, as, as the Archbishop said, we hope that we'll always have sin in, in the church, but 
I think the major problems were dealt with, and my time uh, being present there was to make sure that anything that was still unresolved, uh, there was a priest who had had boundary violations and nothing that could be um, proven. But um, when I did come, it was recommended that I uh, ease some of the restrictions, and I consulted with, in this case, the Metropolitan Archbishop Sarton, uh, who gave me advice not to. And I was glad because a year later, a credible allegation came through, and now we have another one, and uh, that was thoroughly investigated. There is, I think, a very important role for those, I keep stressing, with uh, law enforcement background who um, have the appropriate respect for anyone in leadership, but not one that blinds them from, from what needs to happen. So we were very uh, fortunate that to deal with those issues. Um, the other issue had to do, I think, with uh, finances. And we've all been said, we've heard that the next wave uh, will be financial. We saw a couple of religious sisters, as you know, uh, in Southern California who seemed to be able to convince people it was, wasn't unusual for them frequently to go to Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> More locally, not to touch on a sensitive issue, but there was a, a, bish, a priest who seemed to have a lot of spare change in the trunk of his car locally. 95,000 is a little bit much to have for the parking meter, but it's, um, I think these things about financial accountability also warrant because as financial, finance councils of diocese, again, uh, need to seek uh, what is actually uh, the truth. And I think one of the things I found, whether it's the Review Board or Finance Council, sometimes a phrase is thrown around in the church a lot, we promise you transparency. I don't like the word transparency because to me it reminds us that we've almost, it gives the impression we've been coached by public relations people. It's like when someone, a disaster, our thoughts and prayers are with you. What does that really mean? What does transparency mean? I think we should, as the church, remove the word transparency and give a word that we all know and understand, truth we promise to give you the truth. So I think that that's, um, and, and that's what I think we're fortunate. So I've been blessed that to, to kind of be part of it with very good lay people and priests uh, to uh, see kind of a brighter future um, with moving beyond it. But uh, we still need these, these committees, and I think at the beginning, probably all of us up here in November argued about the role because my thoughts were talking to lay people, they're groaning, they were and are impatient. They want the church to be the bride of Christ. They want us to be shepherds who care for our flock. And uh, the latest thing about the issues of, of um, uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, um, uh, you know, who was watching the store? I mean, you've see, read some of the things about fresh flowers that had a bill of 130 plus thousand dollars a year, and I think some of this occurred on the part of clergy, uh, priests, that, uh, well, we don't want to rock the boat too much. And again, my impression of, uh, of conversations with lay people, good faithful lay people, that um, this is like your last chance. Uh, we trusted you, and we want you to do which, what we would expect you to do as our shepherds, as successors of the apostles. And that takes a lot of humility and commitment to the truth and, of course, grace. So that's my experience, limited, much more limited than, than perhaps those from big dioceses or archdioceses. But um, I certainly learned a lot from the lay people there. What they said. <laughs> I'll add a few words. Um, I thank uh, Bishop Paprocki for a good, succinct analysis of where we are procedurally. Those are important, but I really like what Bishop Daly said. It's about truth. It's about faith. I mark uh, with joy that this is your anniversary, Archbishop, the anniversary of making those promises that I applaud you. I don't, we don't know each other well, but I've seen you speak up the truth in critical ways as an archbishop of the church. That's what we need.
I've been a bishop a little longer than Bishop Daly. It'll be seven years in East Texas, Tyler. Um, I grew up there. I guess I'm still growing up in some ways. They still call me Father Joe very often because I was the kid priest who showed up there in 1985 and they never got rid of me. <laughs> but I think that has, has been a blessing for me in all of this. The procedures are important. In many ways, the Catholic Church invented procedures. Canon law is ancient. That kind of structuring, many of the legal systems of the world have looked to. So yes, we need those procedures, but we need to go much further and much deeper. Having been blessed to grow up where I'm a bishop, to be a priest there, for my whole priesthood, and then to be named a successor of the apostles, maybe the Holy Spirit especially used that in my heart because I didn't feel like a successor of the apostles. I was just Father Joe. And many people still called me Father Joe. And then as time went on and I kept hearing you're a successor of the apostles, in the midst of all of this, as someone said, tsunami, as the word has been used, filth and corruption in the church and in the world, we have to acknowledge it. The church, sadly, is reflecting the world at this point. But I think that what's been a blessing to me is to be, I, I smell like the sheep of East Texas. I know those people. I grew up with them. Most of them are not Catholic. <laughs> I walk around, very often I wear the, the more formal uh, bishop's cassock, <laughs> and there in East Texas, I've been greeted numerous times, and people have said, hey, Pope. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in an area where people don't know what Catholic means, really in a lot of ways. But I go back to those promises that the Archbishop made 31 years ago. And the, one of the key promises that I keep going back to is guarding the deposit of faith. That is the best way to implement these procedures. And I guess the final thing I would say is fraternal correction. For us, as brother bishops, for all of us as members of the church, lay or clergy, it's our church, it's our beloved faith community that Jesus Christ established. And we need to have those open hearts of fraternal correction. If we had, had been stronger in that with Theodore McCarrick, who is a son of God, who needs the redemption we all need, we pray that he is drawn closer to Christ. We need to do that for each other and certainly use the procedures, but be about the truth and be willing to be corrected as you have to correct your kids when they get on a false path to be corrected and be renewed in that truth of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. George, um, George, can I just? Oh, sure. Yeah, me, I just want to talk a little bit about my experience with the review board as well. I've been, I've been working with the uh, review board since I was uh, chancellor of the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1992. And uh, one of my first tasks was to help create a review board uh, and the policies to direct them. And uh, since we were one of the first, it also met with uh, uh, some resistance. And people were saying, uh, well, Priests are accountable to their bishop. How can you have lay people involved in this? And, and our answer was, well, yes, priests are involved. They're, they're accountable to their bishop, but, uh, they, uh, but their bishop can have his advisors. Uh, and uh, similarly with uh, proposals for lay people to, to be involved with the review of cases against bishops, they say, well, bishops are only accountable to the pope, so how can you have lay people involved? Well, again, 
uh, the, the Pope can have whatever advisors he's, he wants in that. So we, we had this review board system uh, in place uh, 10 years before it, it became mandatory uh, through the, uh, the Dallas Charter and the norms. And my experience with it has, has been that it's been very, uh, very helpful to have the input of, of lay people in assessing these cases and, and coming to conclusions about them. I also want to mention that in the Diocese of Springfield, we have a separate uh, panel. It's called the Special Panel on Clergy Misconduct that deals with allegations of uh, financial misconduct and sexual misconduct with adults. Uh, it was my predecessor, predecessor, Bishop George Lucas, who is now the Archbishop of, uh, of Omaha, who put this into place uh, in 2005 when there were allegations uh, involving a number of priests with uh, adult sexual activity and financial misconduct, as well as with his predecessor as Bishop of Springfield in Illinois, uh, Bishop Daniel Ryan, who was Bishop from 1984 to, to 1999, who was uh, unfortunately also involved with um, homosexual activity with uh, adults and minors. And so the special panel uh, that Bishop Lucas put into place uh, is headed by, and which I've kept and I continue to use, it uh, is headed by uh, a former federal prosecutor who is now in private practice, law practice in, in Springfield, and uh, also majority of lay people. Uh, there is a separate uh, hotline that people can call with allegations that goes directly uh, to uh, the, the, uh, law, the law office of the chairman of the special panel. There's also an email, uh, a dedicated email that goes directly to his office. So we have these systems in place. Uh, I found it helpful to have two, two different bodies, one dealing with uh, a sexual abuse of minors and the other with adults and uh, financial misconduct, because there are different issues and different consequences for those. So that's the experience that, that I've had. I also have found over the years, I mean, we're talking about, um, as a canon lawyer, talking about the procedures here, but as a bishop, I'd have to say the bottom line is I really think the key issue is for renewal and spirituality uh, and a deepening of our spiritual commitment uh, on this, because I've seen many of the cases where priests have unfortunately gone down uh, the slippery slope of, of sinful behavior, that it starts with, um, with neglect, neglecting their prayer life. And uh, they stop saying the liturgy of the hours, they start, start rationalizing, my work is my prayer, and it becomes, they become more a CEO of a little organization rather than uh, a pastor of a parish. So as a, my conversations with my priests, that's the things I'm trying to emphasize more and more is what we really need to focus on is a spiritual renewal. Bishop Strickland's uh, description of East Texas reminds me of my late great friend, Father Richard John Newhouse, who some of you may know once spent a year running a gas station in West Texas. And he said that it was often said of this part of very dry, very hot West Texas, that there's nothing wrong with West Texas that a little water and a few good people wouldn't fix, <laughs> which Father Newhouse said the same thing could be said of hell. <laughs> but we're all grateful for Texas, and we all may be moving there in due course. <laughs> I'd like to draw out in this second round a bit more on the, on the question of financial uh, accountability. Um, bishops have many charitable demands made on them. People come to the bishop looking for help. How can the bishop meet those charitable demands that, that may involve privacy issues, people in deep trouble that they don't want to become public, while being truthful and accountable uh, in terms of their financial stewardship because the money they're giving away in these charitable circumstances uh, has been given to them. Second question, um, should there be considered a national policy uh, on financial accountability? Perhaps that's already in place and I just don't know about it. Is that unnecessary? But in order to meet this sense to which Bishop Daly referred that this is the next tsunami coming at us. Uh, would some address to that uh, set of problems? 
by, uh, by the conference as a whole, by the bishops' conference as a whole, be useful. Uh, and, and finally, I would like to switch off of that for just a second and, and ask each of the bishops to reflect on this question of fraternal correction. Uh, I think we are all, we've all been concerned, uh, I know I have in my conversations with, with many bishops over the last 30 years, that a false notion of Episcopal collegiality has taken hold, uh, that what was intended, uh, what was always in the life of the church, go back to the North African fathers, they're beating on each other all the time on very serious doctrinal questions, that a false notion of collegiality is a kind of club atmosphere has dulled this edge of fraternal correction. How, how can we recover that today? Um, uh, and uh, not necessarily in, in a public way. Uh, we're not looking for a Twitter spasms of fraternal correction among bishops. We get enough Twitter spasms from other sources in our country. Uh, but how might we, how, how might you uh, revive what really is an ancient tradition in the church? So. Uh, how do you meet the charitable demands made on you uh, while being uh, accountable? Uh, should there be some sort of national address to the problem of financial accountability? And how does fraternal correction get uh, resurrected in the church? We'll just go Archbishop Shapu, Bishop Paprocki, Bishop Daly, Bishop Strickland. Uh, well, make sure you keep me on track, though, George. You know, in terms of fraternal correction, it's really hard to, to do fraternal correction with someone you don't know very well. and. Uh, when you're dealing with facts that you're not aware of. I mean, so I, I wouldn't know how to begin to do fraternal correction, even within the province of Pennsylvania, there are eight dioceses in the province that I a metropolitan archbishop of, because I don't know. I mean, the fact that I get one letter from one lay person telling me that Bishop so-and-so is a rotten guy, I mean, am I supposed to correct him? I mean, it's hard for me to do that when I don't know if these facts are true. Um, I have a duty of certain, of course, to share that information with him, but to correct him is another thing. Now, you know, I guess the issue of Cardinal McCarrick um, makes, raises the question of fraternal correction. Um, I had, I, you know, I was living in Rapid City in Denver when so much of this was going on. I didn't hear all these things about him, so how could I possibly make fraternal corrections? And again, even for those bishops who were living closer, if they just heard gossip, how do you do fraternal correction with gossip? I'd also like to make this point. You know, it, it, it's, I hope you all know that bishops in the East Coast actually did write to Rome by way of the nuncio complaining about things they had heard about Cardinal McCarrick. They did that on more than one occasion. And I know that the nuncios in Rome sent that information to the Holy See. Also, no, nothing happened, you know. But the fact that it's just important for us to know that they didn't just sit around and ignore this. They actually acted with the information that they had. At least some of them did. So we can't, we can't sit around and judge them from distance. Now, having said that, if, if a bishop would do, say, do something publicly, uh, let's say on an area of doctrine or whatever, and I, know, I read about it, I've been known to write to that bishop and try to issue my opinion about how things should be corrected. But it's really important. We can't operate off gossip it's very important that we have real information. And I think the setting up these hotlines have been very, very helpful because they do enable us to actually get information that's real in ways we didn't have it before. Should there be a national policy for financial accountability? We have a, we have a small one. You know, every bishop is required to submit a, an annual report signed by all the members of the Finance Council with the financial documents of the Archdiocese to the Metropolitan and I'm, as a metropolitan, required to submit that to the Bishop of Pittsburgh, who is the second in age uh, in terms of ordination as a bishop in the province of Pennsylvania. Now, when I get those reports, I submit them to my finance office. They review them, tell me whether or not everything's in order, and then I write back and say, thank you very much for sending this information. Now, are those reports that we receive honest? I don't, I, I don't know how to evaluate that on my own, but I trust my finance office to do that well. So I think there's a little bit of that in place. Whether we do more, I don't know. I don't know what, what we should do about that. Now, in terms of gifts that bishops give, um, I think some dioceses have charitable accounts that the bishop has access to, and then his 
decisions are reviewed by the Finance Council, probably. And the Archives of Philadelphia has no money, so we don't have a, we don't have a, but I have a personal one that I use, that I put all the gifts that I receive that um, are the result of my work as a bishop into that account, and I use it for the poor. Um, and of course, those checks are reviewed by my finance office, as all of my checks are. Um, but uh, I don't know if I'm even responding to your question, George, but <laughs> somebody else want to go from here? Well, uh, the, the question of financial accountability is, is a very uh, important one, and, and different solutions have been proposed over the years. I think one, uh, one solution is that you, you set up um, uh, corporations uh, of, of which uh, the, the bishop is not a member, he's not on the board, he has no voice on this, and so the, you'll have a board uh, that the, the bishop is not involved with in any way. And, you know, I can understand in one sense the, uh, the desire to say, well, well, we'll protect against the bishop misusing the funds because he won't even have a, any access to them or control over them. On the other hand, uh, if we say the bishop is the successor of the apostles and he is to uh, teach, sanctify, and govern, how do you govern uh, a diocese when you have no control uh, of the money? So I don't think that that's necessarily uh, the proper answer and, and to, to remain uh, a Catholic church. We become a congregational model then where perhaps the, the bishop is simply a chaplain uh, to the diocese and, and that's not our, our structure. Another approach we, we talk about from a legal perspective is respecting donor intent. So I think donors uh, be, become much more aware of that and they'll, so they'll give donations uh, to the diocese or to parish saying, I want the money used for this. Uh, and both in canon law and in civil law, that donor respect, uh, donor intent has to be uh, respected. I also uh, think that it's, it's, um, it's a reality that I don't know that we'll ever, given the reality of original sin and the human condition, that we'll, we'll ever be able to say, well, well, we'll never have financial misconduct or any other kind of misconduct again. Um, I was very much mindful of this during Holy Week and my, my homilies that week, starting with Palm Sunday. And uh, the Palm Sunday uh, passion narrative this year was from the Gospel of Luke, and it starts out with the description of the Last Supper. And so, and this is, uh, so the institution of the, of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, this is the very first Mass ever being celebrated in Jesus with his apostles, his first bishops. And what does St. Luke tell us? He tells us that uh, Jesus uh, tells his new, his new bishops that one of you will betray me, one of you will deny me. Uh, and then St. Luke uh, goes on to point out that while they were uh, having this Last Supper, this first Eucharist, a fight broke out amongst them uh, as to who was the greatest. These are the first bishops fighting over who was the greatest among them. Uh, and then the readings for Holy Week, uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, all focus on Judas and, uh, and his um, uh, malfeasance uh, of, of, of funds. I mean, and here is Jesus' handpicked CFO. And uh, so right from the very beginning. So I, I say that in the sense of if we're longing for some uh, golden age where everything was perfect and every bishop was perfect, uh, I don't think that ever was, even from very, the very beginning of Jesus' first Episcopal Council. Uh, I'm not saying that to say, well, we don't have to worry about this. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, the reality is the church is in very human hands uh, and very imperfect hands, and uh, uh, we just, whatever safeguards that we can have uh, to uh, find those uh, uh, problems, as apparently they were found even in Jesus' time, that I, Judas was identified as the thief, the treasurer who was the thief, that when we find something and someone that's doing something wrong, that we, uh, we address it uh, quickly and effectively. Uh, my experience prior to being uh Bishop uh, was uh, to, to run a high school just in Marin County here, just the county south at Marin Catholic. And when I became president, I uh, received a call from the Archdiocese saying, uh, I've been assured by the previous administration that we were fine financially. And I received a call saying that, uh, when are you going to pay the Archdiocese the million point seven you owe us? And uh, at that time, I think the four Archdiocesan schools pulled their money together. That, that has changed. But I learned from there. I, we had been receiving accounting reports, and uh, this accounting firm, it seemed we were carrying debt for seven years or something, and 
uh, fortunate it was good to have someone on the board who challenged the, the firm. And I think uh, Kapamian and Spokane, uh, after being an auxiliary in, in San Jose Diocese for four years, which really you just observed until you become uh, bishop of your own diocese, I think it's always very good to make sure that there are no cozy relationships with accounting firms or members of the, the committee, because especially in a smaller towns, um, that, that can happen. I'm not saying that it always leads to bad things, but it is very good, because I have, my experience has been the people of God can forgive the faults of priests, but don't do anything to the children and don't take any other money. And I think that that has been very true. Um, fortunately, when I came to the diocese, we received a significant gift of money for the bishop's charity, which was promptly invested, um, most of it. And, uh, but I use it for Catholic schools um, where there's a shortfall and sometimes there has been not the proper um, leadership. And one of the things of, in our school system that I think is a lot of times take out ill will and crookedness, um, there, is, there are levels of incompetence sometimes in people in parish and school settings that have to be addressed. And um, to me, the schools and the faith formation or young people are the top priority. And I would hate to have um, any, any school. So, less of on the diocesan level, but more the local site. And um, it is a challenge in certain rural small communities to have people who have the skill set um, to, to give advice uh, to, to, to the pastor and to the diocese. And uh, as one thing, having grown up in a city of San Francisco, now being in a farming community, the farmers are very good about watching every dollar. And uh, in the parishes where I've, there's been some type of difficulty, it has been brought to my attention by uh, the, the, the lay people, the farming farmers. I agree with Bishop Rocky. We're not chaplains, however, where we're told this is where the money is going to go. I think as bishops, we receive a lot of requests. And not everybody would always agree, for example, in my case, um, that, that helping schools uh, rebuild is, is, is certainly a strong priority. And also rural parishes where the population has shifted, the, the gospel still needs to be proclaimed up in the parishes near the Canadian border that no longer are mining towns and other things, and it, it does require us to assist. And certainly seminary and priestly formation, that has been a big challenge in my diocese, but I have found that, again, the people of God will give to that when you tell them this is a designated fund, it will go to seminary education, you can be assured of that. Um, probably all of us would say is the one thing that aggravates people and they will ask, I'm not gonna give to the bishop's appeal if you're gonna use it to pay lawyers. And uh, that's probably a widespread feeling. Regarding fraternal correction, um, I, I have, um, never really, uh, I've joked with the senior, in my, the, the metropolitan of Seattle has, there were only three dioceses, Seattle, Yakima, and um, uh, Spokane. And um, we like to kid one of the, the, the senior suffragan who made it very clear he was the senior suffragan when I arrived uh, in, the, in, the, in the diocese. But I think I, it, it takes, I think, uh, Older men who have respect and can quietly not grandstand and do that, but uh, you know as well as I, fraternal correction even within families can be a challenge. Uh, but um, nonetheless, it's something I think now we learned if we hear something, and how we say it is, is so essential. But I would defer to the, those who have been on the job longer and have greater wisdom as to how that best and most effectively, effectively can be done. With regard to the finances, I would agree with what the other bishops have said. I can say I was rector of the cathedral where I am now bishop. I was rector there for 16 years. And during that time, I really learned how important a really functioning lay finance council is for a parish and for a diocese. We've heard this week how you as laity have a significant role in the church. You always have, and, and I think in this time especially, and especially in the finance area, many of you are experts. Probably, I could speak for myself, but I think I speak for most bishops, I never took a finance course in my life. 
I'm really not sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> I have to acknowledge those, that's a skill set that I don't have. In canon law, it's required for a parish to have a functioning finance council. Um, a pastoral council is more at the discretion of the local diocese, but a finance council for every parish. But it needs to really be functioning. And it, it goes back to, it, it kind of, to me, goes back into the, the idea of fraternal correction. And I appreciate especially what Archbishop said, because it is something to be very careful and very um, just with and, and to really be responsible uh, in that. But I think we need to, not just for bishops to correct bishops, but for the body of Christ to recognize that we are called to be disciples. Going back to, as, as Bishop Paprocki said, uh, taking us back to that beautiful scene of, of the first of the apostles or the, the first bishops, the ones that we're the successors of, and so, certainly Judas Iscariot, the, the betrayer. That didn't happen in that case. Maybe, you know, maybe Thomas and Peter are saying, what's, what's Judas doing with the money? <laughs> Obviously, nobody really stepped up. And, and I think that that is something we owe to each other, again, recognizing that Christ has lived, died, and risen for all of us to save us, to offer everlasting life. We're on that path in any way that we can help each other. Uh, I think we're, we're called to do that. I think probably I can speak for the other three bishops. We didn't know uh, personally or even rumor-wise for myself about Theodore McCarrick and what was going on. But there were friends, there were close associates who knew things. I think there's still that reality out there. And I think that part of the healing that we need in the church is a clear accountability, not in an attacking way, not in an unjust way, but in the greatest justice to call, we're all sinners, as someone kind of alluded to, if you want sinless bishops, good luck. <laughs> it's not going to happen. We might like a sinless laity. Good luck. <laughs> but I think in the mystery of why did the king of the universe, the Lord of all, who had power, over heaven and earth, all power, why did he allow Judas to even happen? That's part of the mystery of our salvation history in Jesus Christ. So I think we need to call ourselves back to those fundamentals of truth that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose to reveal to the world and to help us all be accountable with finances, with moral questions, with everything, to be true disciples. That's been the challenge since Christ walked this earth. That, as Bishop Paprocki said, it's about restoring faith and doing our best as sinful, broken individuals and as a broken church to live that faith more deeply. We've, we've only got about three minutes left, so I'm going to ask uh, the bishops if, if any of them has a closing comment they'd like to make, uh, a word of encouragement to offer, uh, a suggestion further uh, to all of us. We've got about three minutes for that, so I will leave this last three minutes to all of you. Just remember the gospel is good news. It's good news. The um, thing I would say is uh, most of you can trust your bishops. They really, I've been around for a long time, and the vast majority of these gentlemen are very good men, committed to the truth and committed to preaching the gospel. 
Um, please don't judge all of us in the light of the few who have done a horrible job and been scandalized, the source of the scandal in the church. I'm sure there's some others that we don't know about, but the vast majority of these men are really good men. There's, uh, since, uh, since September 11, 2001, we've heard the, the phrase, if you see something, say something. And, and that's helpful uh, advice, but we also have to keep in mind, uh, make sure you're sure about what you see, and then when you say something, say it to the proper authorities. Because if you just say it amongst yourselves, then it's just rumors and gossip. But if you have a real concern about something, if it's illegal, you call the public authorities and you report it. If uh, it involves uh, uh, ecclesiastical uh, personnel, you can all, all, could and also should involve uh, and report it to the church. But I, I also want to make a plea to be on guard against false accusations. Because the devil is part of all of this, and the devil is the father of lies, and the devil is the accuser of our brothers. And, uh, and, and so and I've, in my years, I've also seen a number of false allegations, and we need to be also very concerned, but not only the damage that occurs from misconduct, but also be on guard of the damage that could occur uh, with false allegations. And uh, Pope Francis has spoken very frequently about uh, gossip and, and rumors, and so I just ask people to be on guard with that as well. I think the advantage of a church that's over 2,000 years old is the context of history. And one of the great uh, saints of the church I often quote uh, is St. Vincent de Paul. And there was a belief, a kind of a phrase at the time uh, of his life that if you want to be one of the churches, one of her enemies, be one of her priests. And it was the corruption of the clergy and certainly the bishops. The church has been humiliated. And um, if, if we're not humble, we will be humiliated. But I think we're, if this is a call to, to humiliate across the board. I use the phrase, the, 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 why did the McCary thing happen? Um, those who knew something, I call it, they are on the ecclesiastical escalator. It was all about getting further in the church, so we're not going to say anything. We'll keep a lid on it. And I think hopefully this will be a breaking up as much as we can in light of the human condition uh, to move away from that, to, to really be humble servants. That doesn't mean weak but it means um, to be humble. And I think that humility is truth. We're all, um, we all, the words of Paul, everything, why would he boast? Everything we have, we've received. And we have this great gift of faith, this great church. And at a time of secularism, we cannot let our actions give people another reason not to come, know, to, come to know Jesus Christ. So I would see, I'd ask across the board, prayers for humility. Look at the great priests and religious who were reformers of the church. And during time of great sin in society, the church raises up holy men and women, priests and religious. During great corruption in the hierarchy, the laity rise up. And perhaps we're coming together now to trust in Christ uh, as our Savior and bring this church, his church that he founded through Mary's intercession, to be truly the body of Christ. I know we're way past three minutes, but I got, you know, I'm one of these guys, I got to talk. The prayer that George began with mentioned the word pillars. And I've been inspired in reading, especially St. John Bosco, the pillars that we can rely on to fix all of this, to fix ourselves, to grow in Christ, the pillar of the real presence of Jesus Christ and the Blessed Sacrament, and the pillar of devotion to his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thank you. Thank you all, bishops, very, very much. Let me, permit me to just make three points by way of, I hope, takeaways at the end of this session. Uh, what I've heard is that while there is much work left to be done, it is also the case that much has been done. And I think it is an objective reality that the church in the United States is the leader in the world church in addressing these crucial issues of misconduct and malfeasance and misgovernance. Uh, and we should know that. 
And we should be grateful to the bishops who have led us into that leadership position in the World Church, which we hope uh, will eventually be recognized uh, by others. Uh, secondly, I think you've seen that each of these four bishops understand that there is not some sort of zero-sum game going on here. That lay involvement in addressing these issues, these sins and crimes, enhances the authority of the bishop. It doesn't diminish it. And I think that's a very good sign going forward. Uh, I spoke yesterday about the courage to be countercultural, and I now want to extend that by way of Archbishop Chaput's challenge to all of us and suggest that each of you tell your friends and associates that the sexual abuse of the young is a society-wide plague in our country, that the Catholic Church today is probably the safest environment for young people in the country, and that we in the church have, through some very hard experience, learned some things that could be useful to others, businesses, the public school system, scout troops, and other youth organizations in all of us coming together as a country to address this terrible plague that is upon us. So thank you again, bishops, for your time. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Archbishop Chapio is right to your left. Hey, thank you so much. Well, thank you so very, very much uh, to all of you bishops. It, it was just great. Uh, all of you are e exemplars of the courage and the prudence and the justice and above all the prayer that it takes to be in your position and you're just great exemplars for the rest of the bishops on what a real bishop does to make reform possible within the church. Thank you again so very, very much.